Glad that you're all able to uh, be here tonight. As Butch mentioned, it has been a very busy day. Lots of things going on with the devotional and uh, lads to leaders. And um, uh, Phoebe's been here with us today. And so lots of things going on. Been a busy weekend. Uh, thank you to the guys that traveled over yesterday for the leadership conference in Dalton. I know that was uh, beneficial to you. And uh, a special thank you to those people that made cakes. Um, they were very, very good. And a very special thank you to whoever made the red velvet cake. Um, I don't know who that was, but you will receive a special blessing for that. Uh, it was really good. And I uh, all know who made this. Brenda Rittenberry's pound cake was really good, too. So um, thank you for, uh, for doing that. I know it was very much appreciated. Um, in the lesson tonight, you can go ahead and open to Romans chapter 8. Um, it's sort of weird this week. Um, Butch and myself and Curtis and Shirley and, and Barry were all over at Faulkner for the the lectureship, and, and uh, I had already planned on preaching from Joshua chapter 4 tonight, and we're, we're going to get to that, but one of the things that was done one day during chapel um, by Brother Lonnie Jones just really struck me, and, and, and what he was talking about was how God works in our lives, and, and I know that's sort of a, a very broad subject, but specifically he dealt with how, how God can turn things that are really bad into things that are really, really good, or how maybe even more than that, that God is always working in our lives in ways that we don't understand. There's a, about a minute and a half YouTube clip that uh, if you guys can pull that up and get the volume turned up, we're going to watch this, and, and then maybe we'll elaborate on that point a little bit more. If you could cut these lights at the front, that would help too. Oh, say can you see by seen that uh, before. Isn't that a really, really cool um, picture that we end up with? That gentleman's name is Joe Everson, and uh, he does that at, at various events, uh, singing uh, the national anthem and painting that picture. And, and the first time I ever saw that, uh, we were watching a sporting event live, and they did that, and, um, and I was amazed because he was painting the whole time, and I said, what is this guy doing? Um, you know, he's, a, he's an okay singer. He's not Whitney Houston singing the anthem or anything, but the whole time thinking, man, it's really cool that he's doing this. And then at the end, it flips it around and we see the whole picture. Here's what I know about God. Here's what I believe about God. I don't believe that the God that created me and the God that I serve causes bad things to happen in my life. I don't think that God causes me to get a disease. I don't think that God causes people to, to hurt me. I don't think that he intentionally ever does anything bad in my life. And some people will disagree with that, and that's okay. What I do think that my God does is takes bad situations and uses them to his glory and turns them around to be good in my life. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, probably the most often quoted verse um, in modern times, Romans 8, 28, it says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Uh, Lonnie Jones sort of dealt with this subject a little bit in one of his devotionals. And, and he and I had a conversation about this yesterday during lunch at the workshop. And <clears throat> we were sort of talking about that. 
And, and it's amazing what God does. He used this um, illustration, um, and, and, he, and he's, uh, he's an artist, and he can do this sort of stuff. And a lot of times he'll take scribbles like this and help turn them in to, to artwork like that. He, he told a story of um, a, a parent from his church calling, and their child had taken red magic marker and written all over the wall. And they said, Lonnie, come and salvage this. And so he took a red marker and filled it in and turned it into a mural on that child's Wall. And, and I really think that's how God works. And, and, and I think that if we were to think about it, we could see how that has happened in our lives as well. When something that, that is bad that we think is the end of the world, that'll never ha- that we'll never get over it, that somehow if we've been obedient to, to God, the called according to his purpose are Christians, people that have been obedient to God, we can see how he's taken that bad thing and turned it into something good. It's not always easy to see. Not always something that we want to see, but God is always in the background working. And here's the thing, just like that video that I showed you, sometimes it's not until the very end that we will understand and know how God was working and is working. Farther along, we'll know all about it, as we've always sung, right? And so, and so we, we have to thank God and, and, and be appreciative of all the things that he does in our lives. And so, so that brings us to Joshua chapter 4. You turn your Bibles there. We know that God did something amazing in the life of the Israelites, in the collective lives that they shared together. <clears throat> he took them from slavery to the land flowing with milk and honey. He took them from being under bondage to being free. He took them from being a people without a home and without an identity to living in the greatest place in the world that he had promised to them. But I know that they didn't always see and understand because when they were in the wilderness, which we talked about this morning is where we find ourselves today in our own sort of wilderness living in this life, that when they were in the wilderness, they didn't always understand or appreciate what God was doing. They said, God, we want food. He rained down manna. They said, God, we're tired of manna. We want the things that we had back in Egypt. They said, God, we we don't want to be here in the wilderness. We want to be home. God, we don't want to worship you. We want to worship a golden calf. God, we don't want Moses to be our leader. We want somebody else. And they never understood how God was working. And it wasn't until that final moment this morning that we talked about when they finally crossed the River Jordan and saw what was in front of them that they learned to be thankful to God. And so they did something. In Joshua chapter 4, they built a memorial. And the entire point of of this discussion, and, and we're making modern application to this ancient event, is do we remember and are we thankful for the things that God has woven and put together and worked out for good in our lives? Or do we forget? Do we forget? We live in a nation that's full of monuments and memorials. There's a very well-known memorial at North Georgia College in Dahlonega that says, all gave some and some gave all. There are war memorials all over our country. The Vietnam War Memorial for for the world wars, the Civil War. We, We see all these monuments. There's a big discussion right now to take some of those remembrances down from the Civil War. We can know and see some very famous, (coughs) excuse me, memorials. This is the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C. If you go there, you'll see um, a a tribute, a memorial to uh, George Washington. You'll see a very well-known one to Abraham Lincoln where you can go and sit on the steps and ponder along with old honest Abe. We'll see these all over the place. <coughs> Mount Rushmore in South Dakota is a tribute to what we see as the, the greatest presidents that have ever served the United States. <clears throat> in New York City, we remember the tragedy of September 11th with a new memorial that's there that pays tribute to all those people that innocently lost their lives on that tragic day. Memorials are tremendously important. And the reason they're important is because we forget. You may have heard the joke uh, about a guy named John who had a bad memory. 
John ran into his friend one day, a friend named Bill, and he said, Bill, you remember I've always had a, a bad memory, so I went to a conference to try to learn how to remember things better. And he said, John, that's great. How's it working out? And John said, it's working out fantastic. And Bill said, well, John, I'd like to do that. What's the name of the conference? And he said, he said let me think about it. He looked at Bill. He said, Bill, what's that, what's that plant that uh, has the thorns on it and the petals, and you give it at Valentine's Day, he said, a rose. He looked at his wife, he said, Rose, what was the name of that conference that we went to? <clears throat> we have bad memories, right? We forget things. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm the world's worst. I can remember big things that happened, but it's really hard for me to remember details of, of events. That got me in a lot of trouble when Carl and I were dating. Do you remember our first date? No, <laughs> I don't remember the date. I remember we, you know, what we did. But, and, and so it's really important that we remember things. And the nation of Israel had struggles to remember things as well. Leave a marker in Joshua 4 and turn over to the book of Judges. Just the next book over. This is immediately after the life of Joshua in Judges chapter 2, starting in verse 7. <clears throat> Joshua 2, verse 7. <clears throat> so the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Those people that had seen it happen always remembered. And... Now, verse 8, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him with the border of his, of his inheritance at Ten Math Harris in the mountains of Ephraim in the north side of Mount Gash. And when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. And then in verse 11, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And then go to Judges 17, just a few chapters later. This is the consequences. These are the consequences of forgetting what God has done. Listen to this in, Ju in Judges 17, verse 6. Judges 17, verse 6. And in those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Because they had forgotten what God had done in delivering them into the promised land, they abandoned him. They started worshiping false idols, and they just did whatever they thought was right. Does that sound familiar to us? Sometimes when we forget what God has done in our lives, it becomes easier to do what's right in our own eyes. And so <clears throat> we go back to Joshua 4. God tells them we're going to build a memorial. <clears throat> Joshua Chapter 4, we'll start in verse 1, Joshua 4, 1. And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people and one man from every tribe, and commanded them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. And Joshua called the twelve men whom he, whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in the time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? And you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. They would eventually move this memorial later in the chapter to another location. But every time the next generation was to see these stones... They would ask him what it was about. You know, I, I like sort of obscure things. Um, one of the things that they'll tell you in advertising is that you want to have something that will stick in people's minds so they'll be able to identify your, your brand. 
We talked a lot about this with our Reach North Georgia campaign. Anything you see, a poster, a postcard, the website that has to do with Reach North Georgia, there's a very specific thing that we want you to notice about those logos and about that advertising. Anybody know what it is off the top of their head? Hands. If you notice on the postcards, on the website, on the Facebook page, on the poster, there's always hands. It's a hand reaching. And so we want people to identify that. And, and lots of other companies have done lots of different things. And a lot, if, if I was to put up 10 or 12 logos of very well-known companies and brands, you would recognize them. Some of the more iconic things are really simple. I'll always know what a Coke is because I'll see on a red background in white lettering, Coca-Cola. You can take those and recognize them. But some you recognize by just a, a picture of something or, or a logo or whatever it might be that, that stands out. We want something <clears throat> that sticks in our minds. And God, for these people, gave them those stones to remember what he had done. So what about for us? What God did for these people was he took them out of bondage. He led them through a difficult journey. And he gave them salvation in a promised land. Well, what has God done for us? Well, he took us out of the bondage of sin like we talked about this morning. He's leading us on a journey. And he's going to let us enter a promised land. So what's our remembrance? What's our memorial? What's our monument that we celebrate and honor to remember what God's done in our life? It's the Lord's Supper. Tim Hall did a devotional several months back uh, and sort of compared these two things, and that sort of stood out in, in my mind. <clears throat> Those are perfect symmetrical parallels to help us understand how to remember what God has done in our lives. We were having a conversation this afternoon. Um, the theme for Lads to Leaders is, uh, is in remembrance of me. Is that, is that the actual theme of the, yeah, so... So it comes from 1 Corinthians and deals with the Lord's Supper. That phrase, do this in remembrance of me. You can turn your Bibles over to Luke 22 if you'd like to. And one of the questions that they're dealing with in debate is, why do we take the Lord's Supper every Sunday? And the very simple answer to that is, well, the Bible gives us the example and the command to do so. They came together on the first day of the week to break bread. Paul said, when you come together on the first day of the week, this is what you're to do. But we do that because we come together for a memorial, a feast of, of remembrance. It's something that we can do to, to remember that. Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 19, this is the institution of the Lord's Supper. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in what? Remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, <clears throat> which is shed for you. We have the institution there of the memorial feast. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 11. Most of you know these passages. This is just a quick survey of the, the texts that deal with the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23. <clears throat> This is Paul describing it again. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it. Well, for what purpose? In remembrance of me. I want us to look at Acts 4. This is maybe a little bit different way of thinking about this. When we come together to take the Lord's Supper, in a, in a certain sense, we're taking it individually. Think about that. We're taking it individually. Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 10. Acts chapter 4, starting in, in verse 10. 
Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel. This is Peter and John addressing the Sanhedrin after they've been arrested. Whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. And nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And they go on to say, because of that, we can't help but talk about this Jesus. And when we come together to remember what Jesus has done, it's important that we remember what he's done for us individually. Because as, as, as happy as I am that, that everybody here is a Christian, and as much as I want everybody else to be saved, my relationship with God is my first responsibility. And I need to make sure when I come together, I'm thanking God that he saved me as an individual. That he knows every hair on my head. That he knows everything about me. That he created me. And as we talked about in our Bible class this morning, not only did he create us, but he recreated us in the image of his son when we're born again through water and the spirit. I need to be thankful for that. But then in another way, we're also saved collectively. We're also saved together as, as a group. Turn over to Hebrews 10, just really quickly. <clears throat> Hebrews 10, starting in verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having <clears throat> boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us collectively together draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us Together, these are those lettuce statements that we talk about in Hebrews. Hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. It's a reminder that we are saved collectively as well. And when I come together and, 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 and with you and, and we're taking that Lord's Supper, it's not only that I'm in communion with God, not only that I'm remembering the sacrifice that Jesus instituted, but we are remembering as a memorial together. We're not a nation of people, but we're a body of people. We're part of a spiritual kingdom, and together we're taking that as a memorial. And that's a serious responsibility. Not only am I to examine myself, when I come together to remember what God has done for me through his son, we have a responsibility to each other as well. It's a memorial. It's a, rem a remembrance for what God has done. I have this sort of debate in my mind, and this is you thinking with me, so I don't expect you to be able to follow it, but we talk about rewards all the time. And the promised land is, is heaven. I'm not debating that with you. Our ultimate reward is that salvation that will be revealed in the last time when we spend eternity with God. But I think a lot of times in the Bible when we read about rewards and, and blessings, sometimes maybe we think it's talking about heaven. But it's talking about the church. We already are part of something that we need to be remembering. We won't be taking the Lord's Supper in heaven because there'll be no need to remember then because we'll be a part of it. But we need to be thankful for the blessings that we have now. It's a very humbling thing to go and, and visit a, a monument and to visit a memorial or to go to a, to a museum that, that commemorates some event I've heard people tell of, of what it's like to go and, and visit places like Gettysburg and stand on the battlefield knowing what violence took place there. To go and stand at that Vietnam War Memorial. Will Teague in his speech for Lads to Leaders is dealing with uh, memorials and monuments. And one of the things that he talks about is going with his grandfather who fought in Vietnam to visit that memorial and 
and how different it is for him. It's a very humbling thing. But I wonder, those people in Joshua 4 that built that monument, did every time they walked by there, did that, did that lessen the impact of it? <clears throat> did they see it for the first 10 years and say, man, I, I sure am thankful to be in this, in this land. I sure am thankful that we defeated those enemies. I, I sure am thankful that the walls of Jericho fell down. I'm sure am, I'm thankful to not be eating just manna anymore and, and quail. I'm, I'm glad that, that I'm here. And then after 15 years, did they go by those rocks and say, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm glad to be here. And after 20 years, did they say, well, we're here. And obviously, after a generation of people, it was forgotten. Let me ask us this. When we take the Lord's Supper, as new Christians, it's, it's amazing. I've had new Christians come up to me all the time and say, all right, tell me how exactly I'm supposed to break this cracker. You know, a lot of places don't have the little individual things like we do. They still break it off. Am I supposed to break off a big piece or a little crumb or what do I do? How am I supposed to drink the juice? Drink all of it or just, you know, that's exciting. A lot of you that have little kids, you probably have to fight your kids when that tray's coming by because they want to reach up and snatch it. Maybe some of you with older kids have to do the same thing. I don't know. But that passion and that excitement, for those of you that have been Christians 30 years and 40 years and 50 years, when we stand up here on Sunday and that tray comes by you, is it still that same excitement and that passion and that gratitude? Are we still humbled as we remember what's been done for us. Monuments and memorials are amazing things, and we've been told to do that in remembrance of our Lord. What an amazing blessing to be able to wear the name Christian. What an amazing blessing to be able to remember that every week when we come together. What an amazing thing it was <clears throat> when God allowed his people to cross the Jordan River and enter the promised land. And what an amazing blessing it will be for us, something that we don't deserve, when we hear that trumpet sound and we cross our Jordan River and enter the kingdom of heaven for eternity. I get an amen for that? So we offer an invitation, and if you're not in a situation where you feel confident in that, <clears throat> if you doubt that today is the, if today was the day when Christ returned, that you would enter that land of rest, then this is your chance to make that right. And if you're not a Christian, just put this as plainly as possible, outside of Christ, there is no rest for us. There's nothing but an eternity of weariness being lost and separated from God. So if there's anything you need to do tonight, this is the chance as we stand and as we sing. Are you